First of all, I wanted to uh, talk to you all a little bit about why we set up an industry day today. This morning, it's with you all face to face. And then this afternoon, we've got a VTC with upwards of around 15 sites around the country. And we sent out a notification to all of our uh, service related industry um, representatives to just try to give you the background as far as what we're trying to do to deal with the situation. And more importantly, ask for your help. <clears throat> when you look at uh, the way we get work done in naval aviation, when we deal with tough problems, at least for me, there's a pretty simple recipe to how to solve tough problems. You surround yourself with hardworking people who are creative and willing to take on tough challenges. You give them a very clear goal that everybody understands and agrees to, and you have a commitment to work together as a group. And so when you think about that recipe and you think about some of the tough things we got in front of us, we wanted to give you the opportunity to understand the problem, understand the goal we're trying to achieve, and then help us. Um, because as we go through some of the information today, I think it'll give you the context around the situations we're trying to deal with. And we think if we do that for you all, you'll have a better appreciation of what we're trying to do and how we're trying to do it. So with that, I'm gonna go through a series of slides. <clears throat> we do have a handful of frequently asked questions in the back. What we've done is we've asked for input from, from various folks and various sources, and we've taken very specific questions and tried to make them into general questions. Um, so when you see these, if, you, if some of this is on your mind and it's not exactly worded the way you think, please try to just take on board the general comments and the general answers we're giving you because a lot of cases, I can't give you a specific answer to a specific question, but we think we can give you the general intent behind what's going on. Before I get started, <clears throat> I want to share with you all just a little bit of information around what NAVAIR is and what the commands are within NAVAIR, because we're going to talk a lot about finance. And when you all see us work with you, you don't get to see how the finances work how the business of NAVAIR, how the business of NOC AD, WD, and the FRCs really work. So I just want to spend a little bit of time explaining that because it'll give you a little bit of context behind the financial situation. So, <clears throat> excuse me, when you look at NAVAIR as a command, uh, we get direct appropriated dollars that are sent to us. And when those monies are sent to us, they're sent to us directly from the Navy for very specific things that we're, we're responsible for. So if you look at the overall numbers, we get rdt and &E, we get procurement dollars, and we get OMEN dollars sent directly to us. To just give you an idea of what we expected in 13, we were expecting almost $6 billion in research and development money. We were expecting about $19 billion in procurement monies, and that would be both aircraft, weapons, as well as other procurements. We were expecting three almost three and a half billion dollars in OMEN. And so when you add all that up, you're looking at about $27 billion worth of finances. In addition to that, our working capital funds, both NOC AD, NOC WD, uh, aircraft division on the East Coast, weapons divisions on the West Coast, and our fleet readiness centers, three major industrial facilities, one in North Florida and Jacksonville, one in San Diego, and one in Eastern North Carolina. Those organizations are in charge of very specific functions where in many cases they're the expert for that function and the products centered around aviation. So they do work for other folks. That brings in about an additional $8 billion worth of money. So when you add all that up, between the direct appropriated dollars that we get, 27 billion-ish, and another 8 billion uh, of dollars from other services to execute, within these commands, that's the amount of money that we get. It's a lot. When you look at it in total, over 85% of that goes back out to industry. So in many cases, we take the monies in, formulate requirements, develop technical plans, and then we ask industry counterparts to go develop the hardware, software, technical solutions to deliver to the fleet. So that's a rather large amount of money but we also have a rather large amount of functions. We've got 10 operating sites, made, I'll say major operating sites around the country, and we have one over in Japan. So it's actually a worldwide operation. 
And of the organization that we talked about, there's 1,700 military folks attached to the command. There's almost 25,000 civilians attached to the command. And then our contractor workforce is about 6,000, just over 6,000 from a services level. And then we've got about another 3,000 that we use in our contractor logistic support, where when we make a decision not to support an aircraft organically with military, in many cases, we'll use contractors to support that. And so that's a large amount of people. Those amount, and those folks, when you add them all up, it's almost $5 billion of cost just around the people that we have on our teams. And so when we talk about financials, and I give you some of the large Navy issues, that's how we nav air fit in some of these rather large numbers. And it also gives you an appreciation of how much stuff we buy and how many people we need to produce the stuff that we buy. Um, and as we talk about some of the uncertainty, uh, I just want to remind you all, we have about 34 bargaining units within our civilian workforce. So when we're dealing with some of the issues that we're dealing with, that's 34 bargaining units that represent about 11,000 civilians. And so we've got some things that we have to do on our side handling the civilian workforce as well as working with you all. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of context around the organization before we got started. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and go through a handful of slides. <clears throat> First, I'm going to try to give you some awareness around what's going on, give you some key dates and activities, give you a handful of thoughts to consider from a contingency planning standpoint, and then we're going to have three sets of uh, frequently asked questions at the end. And then as we go through that, hopefully we'll have enough time at the end to potentially field a question or two, but as Adele said, I do have a hard stop at 1030. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so three terms that you're going to hear a lot if you're listening to the media and what's going on up with the testimonies yesterday and the day before. The first is continuing resolution. What does that mean? That means you can only spend the money that you had in the same amount from last year. And so you would think, well, that's okay. You're getting about the same money as last year. Well, as long as the work that you're doing this year is the same as last year, it works out great. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that's not the case in the Navy. The second thing you'll hear, no, no transfer authority. So we're not allowed to move around monies. It's very restrictive as far as how much money you can move around between very specific funding lines in the government. And as of right now, uh, we do not have any additional authority other than what we typically have to move monies around. And so we planned on spending more in OMEN this year compared to last year. So transfer authority for us would mean we would like to put more money into our OMEN accounts to support operations. And then the last part is sequestration. In very simple terms, it's an immediate 9% reduction in every funding line that the government has. And that is bi-directed in law and similar to the no transfer authority, it applies to every financial line equally. So when you hear those words, that's what it really means to us. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how each one of those are impacting both the Navy operations and then talk to you a little bit about how it's affecting NAVAIR and our other commands operations. Next slide. I apologize. The engineer in me could not help but put a graph up some pictures, little flow charts. So I immediately apologize for it, but I just couldn't help myself. So the graph on the top, <clears throat> this shows you how much money the Navy was expecting to get to support operations this year and how much we will expect to get if the CR goes for the whole year, if sequestration would be invoked the 1st of March, and no transfer authority was given. So the Navy needed $49 billion to do all of the OMEN across all the commands within the Navy to do everything that we were asked to do. We expect to only get 40 if those three things don't change. So when you think about it, that's a decent drop. The worst part is we spent the first three months spending on the line heading towards 49 because we were hoping 
that this would be resolved in December. And so when you go through your first three months spending more than uh, on the top line, it puts a lot of pressure on the money that you have left. So what it really equates to, and you'll see the two lines start to separate in January, because we started curtailing our spending in January, because we realized that there was no, nothing in the foreseeable future that was going to change, and by law, we we're only going to be able to spend $40 billion unless something changes. So as we started to deal with that, we looked at reducing the remaining cost for the remainder of the year by 25%. That's how you would get to the number of 40 at the end of the year. So that sounds a little bit harder, but it's actually even a little worse because if you take out what's fixed cost within the Navy and you take out what are safety things that we will never stop doing, it's actually a 40% reduction of the things that we can actually trade off between now and the end of the year. So it's really hard. And so, if any of you all read the testimony over the last two days, think about 40% reduction in what we can afford to affect is why you're seeing the significant impacts to the Navy force on the operation side of the house. So how do you get from where you're at in January to, to the 40 billion in September? <clears throat> this is a picture of a chart that the CNO has been using to articulate what would we do to get there. Now, you can't read it on this chart, but each one of these little slices has activity associated with it that would be things we would stop or slow down to allow us to get back to the $40 billion line. And what you'll see is they're color-coded. Some greens, some reds, some yellows. Greens mean important but won't really hurt as bad as some of the other things. Yellow means it's hurting more red really bad. And what they are trying to do is lay it out over time. So these are January, February, March, April, May. And they are telling us to take actions on those as time goes on. So when you see the greens that are in January, those are the things we're doing today. And as you move out on time and you start to see yellows and the reds on the top slice above it, that's when things really start to hurt. And I'll talk to you a little bit about some of that. This red slice is the slice that would get us to sequestration targets. So if you think of the smaller slice, that gets us to solve CRA. The slice in the other activities gets us to sequestration. When you add it all together, it's how we're going to get $9 billion out of this big organization between now and September. So like I told you, we're already taking some of these things on, and we're in February. So a lot of you ask, how are you going to set priorities? And so in the OMEN side, instead of being very specific about very specific work we're doing, I want to talk about general priorities. This account is funds operations, it funds maintenance, and it fun funds support. And so from a priority standpoint, the top priority of the Navy is going to be operations. And what, when you look at operations as a subset of that, forward deployed units are going to be the top priority. So I drew little nickels, dimes, and quarters on the bottom. And part of that was just an image thing to give you a picture, and part of it's real. So if you w see that line that goes from the quarter up to forward deployed operations, the, the impacts are happening already. Last week, the Navy was expected, prepared, to send a battle group to sea, the USS Truman, and all of the small ships that go with it. That entire carrier battle group is still here in the United States, not at sea. Because if they sent it out last week and sent it on a forward deployed operation per its schedule, it would chew up so much money for us and our operations budgets between now and September that the ship that's over there, when it came home, we would have parts of the world where there would be no carrier presence. So the Navy made that decision. And so the thousands of sailors who were ready to go are still here. Now their deployment shifts. 
So now when you think about the personal impact to a sailor, now all of their schedules as far as I was leaving, wife, family, coming back, hoping to see my kids at the end of the next school year, probably going on my next tour of duty to another location, all of that has now changed. And that's an indefinite decision. We're not sure when they're gonna go. So that happened last week. The next one I wanna talk about is the Little Dime, going up to the Get Ready units. We have a USS Lincoln aircraft carrier on the East Coast. This week it was supposed to go into dry dock, and what we mean by dry dock is we take the ships out of the water so that they're not in a corrosive environment, and then this particular ship was gonna go in for a nuclear refueling and overhaul event. That's a long period of time, a very complex operation, and it's pretty expensive. We don't have the money to do that, so it's now sitting at a pier, still in the water, getting light duty maintenance done by maintenance personnel attached to that ship until the Navy can afford to put it into the dry dock. When you start talking about carrier operations and military operations that the Navy and Marine Corps do, I like to call it a dance. It's a dance with a rhythm that allows us to continuously put group, battle groups and naval forces to sea. When you change the music quickly, like we're doing now, the whole thing gets messy. It's like watching a bunch of teenagers at a dance. It's gonna get messy. So that's what we're into now. So now that ship's not on its schedule to get refueled, which means it's not gonna come out when it's supposed to come out, which means the one that was supposed to go in behind it is now got, not gonna be able to go in. So that's happening right now. And then the last one, the nickel, the arrow that goes up to the depot. Right now, this morning, we are talking about how and when do we stop doing maintenance at our three major industrial depots for all the aircraft and all the engines for third and fourth quarter. Because if we spend that money, we won't be on the track for $40 billion. And so we've got a lot of workforce at those three industrial plants that don't know if we're gonna start taking in new airplanes next week. So I share that with you because these slices and these PowerPoint charts and these little words have a lot of really important things behind them right now. And they're actually happening. And so I want you to keep that in mind because when we talk about the precious omen dollars that we get at NAVAIR, 3.3 billion, right now, 2.6, right, Jerry? We think, the, we think our part of the 40 billion is 2.6. So that's a lot, and we're not allowed to spend any more than that, or lots of people get in trouble. Next slide. So let's talk about investment accounts. And when I say investment for you all, I'm talking about rdt and &E and procurements. Uh, there's a handful of types of money accounts for, for those of you who deal with us closely on the budget side, there's probably about six or seven different types of appropriations, but I'm generally gonna talk about everything that's not OMEN, and I'm generally gonna talk about RDT and &E and procurements in a general sense. So what are the impacts to that part of our business? There's really three big things, very similar, same effects that we're talking about in OMEN, but a little different. The first is no, tr no uh, authority to start new programs because of the Continuing Resolution Act. So we within NAVAIR had programs that we were gonna start this year that we're not allowed to start. Um, I'll give you the, the, one of our more important ones. The new aircraft carrier that we're supposed to start to build is not being built right now. So up in Lakehurst, the folks up there have this great technology of a new air launch and recovery system that allows us to put aircraft on and off ships in a, in a much different way. It's advancing us forward from a technology standpoint that was gonna be the next ship to get that equipment. And it's not being built right now. It will not be built until we resolve the, the new start issue. The second part is because we're so short in OMEN, the transfer authority at the Navy level, and I think across the services, if you listen to the testimony over the last two days, they would move some amounts of money out of investment into OMEN to do some of the things that we talked about on the last slide. 
So if there is some transfer authority, you would expect to see the Navy move some monies out of RDT&E and procurements over to Omen to start to put those ships and air wings back uh, into the operational cycle. And then the last one is the potential sequestration impact. On the investment side, that's significant because when we say a 9% reduction, it's every year. It's not just in one year. So the CRA issue is a very much fiscal year 13, we don't have a budget authority. Sequestration affects the whole plan. So that's why it's so important. So from a very general sense, and I'm speaking in, in very general terms, but the responsibility for prioritizing this stuff falls into our PEOs and PMAs. And so I'm gonna give you a couple of big things that I am sure they're thinking about when they're trying to prioritize their dollars. But inside each individual office, their situation's gonna be a little different. RDT&E activities, they're gonna look at the critical, critical activities that support their major program schedules. And so depending on where they're at in the life cycle of their system, it might be an IOC date, it might be a major acquisition milestone, it might be a major design review. Those are the types of things that they're gonna look at their schedules, they're gonna look at the monies that they have left, and they're gonna say, how can I preserve that event to the best that I can, knowing that I don't quite have as much money as I did before. And so you're gonna see them react in that way and focus that priority. On the far side, from a procurement standpoint, there's really two things that we do in procurement. The first thing that we do is we, when we buy the equipment, we stand it up in a fleet. So in many cases, we've got folks on the teams who take the equipment that we buy and they work on how do I implement it into the fleet, how do I stand up new squadrons, how do I stand up new units, how do I put all the logistics in place. They're gonna be focused on holding those deployment schedule or those fielding schedules to make sure that the equipment that we bought is actually gonna get out in the fleet and used in, a, in a, an appropriate schedule. The other thing they're gonna focus on, and this is where most of uh, the bigger chunks of the procurement dollars go, is in production schedules. They're gonna try not to go to such minimum levels of production that they disrupt the lines with industry. And so you're gonna see those two very significant things be a lot of the focus of the programs. So when you ask for what's mission essential within an investment account or an enomen account, if you can just think about these major things that these individuals that are being asked to prioritize in very specific um, taskings, they're driving towards these big things. Next slide. So, so now I talked to you a little bit about what's going on in Omen, a little bit about what's going on in investments. I want to walk you through a little bit of a schedule. And the schedule, in some cases, a diamond really is a diamond. It's really a date that's probably going to happen. In other cases, that diamond is just what we've been told, and I don't know if they'll hold. So I'll tell you what, I, what is for sure. For sure, the Navy submitted a planned OSD last week. And for sure that plan got briefed yesterday and the day before in front of the, the HASC and the SASC subcommittees. Now those plans are very high level plans. The things that I talked to you about as far as carriers being delayed, about carriers not being in dry docks, about depot maintenance programs, that's in the plan that was briefed over the last two days. The date for sequestration decision is the 1st of March and that's a known date. And unless they change and get a budget passed and signed, the date that we run out of our CR allocation would be 27 March. So they would have to have another cash allocation to allow us to continue operations past 27 March. I put transfer authority with a TBD and a question mark because I have no idea if that's gonna take any traction or not. It was clearly discussed at the testimonies over the last two days. It's clearly on the minds of everybody, but whether or not that would happen, that would be a congressional action. So all of that relates to the, just the 13 budget. Below that, these are the mitigation options that were already taken to deal with it. The first is reducing non-labor expenses. We started that in January. 
We started that with our direct appropriated dollars, and the working capital fund folks are looking at the non-labor expenses in their accounts to try to reduce it. Mainly to reduce non-labor expenses to try to preserve as much labor dollars and salary dollars as we can to not affect our people. So we've done that. Travel is curtailed. Conferences have been canceled. So anything that really gets into a non-labor related expense, we're gonna do our best to not spend money on that because we'd rather spend it on the people and the products that we need to produce. The second thing, operations and maintenance plans. Um, maybe this Friday we'll get told to do something related to aircraft and depot maintenance. Maybe next Friday. Next Friday is an important date. We've got a contract vehicle with one of our industrial plants that's got hundreds of people on it that's on a two-week funding document. So that's a, an important message that we need to get from the Navy on what are we going to do. Right below that, civilian hiring freeze. We've got two, two things going on. One, at the Navy level, we're in what they call a hard freeze. So they have basically said, you're not allowed to bring any new people on board inside the Navy until we can figure out how to get back to a $40 billion program on the OMEN accounts. And they've given us a few special exceptions that we can go all the way up to the head of Navy and ask for relief. But other than that, there's no new civilians coming on board. There's a date that I put out in March that they said, if the situation gets better, <coughs> we might allow you to implement your restricted hiring plans. And so what we did is we looked at all of our vacancies, all of our projected vacancies for the remainder of the year, prioritized them down into a very small amount, and said if you gave us limited hiring authority, we would do those types of hires. So until they tell us that we're allowed to implement our plan, we're gonna to have to go all the way up to the top of the Navy to put anybody new on the rolls. And then the last one is potential government civilian furloughs. Those are being discussed. You know, it's easy to talk about what the pricing would be. It's really hard to talk about how you would actually implement it. So right now, my words, we're analyzing impacts. We are not doing detailed planning. And so what do I mean by that? We have no idea how it would actually get executed. Because think about what it would take for us to actually have a plan. All the bases around the country would have to coordinate with all their tenants on the bases to figure out how you would get people on and off the bases how you would deal with security, how you would deal with services, because everybody would be in the same boat. So it's a lot, it will be a lot of coordination, and before we spend all of our energy doing that detailed planning, we're gonna wait for a notification. So anything that you've heard so far is really just pricing the financial impacts of salaries. Beyond that, there's no detailed planning that's being done yet. If a notification goes out, we'll start the detailed planning. But remember, we talked about 10 operating sites. There's 10 different base CEOs who map the different regions who are gonna have a lot of money that's not gonna be available for them, and they were already short money when we started this year, who are gonna have to try to deal with all of us tenants who are never happy with what they're giving us because they don't have enough money to begin with. So it's gonna be hard. So I want you to understand that we're really not into the detailed planning yet. And then lastly, on the bottom, <clears throat> and I, I really left this here just so y'all could feel a little bit of the pressure that we do. The government always has three budgets running at the same time. The people who do the budgeting for the out year budgets aren't always the same people who do the budgeting for the execution year budgets. So while we're trying to deal with all this stuff at the top of this chart, to get through executing 13, there are people in the Pentagon who are asking us for plans for 15. And that might sound a little awkward, <laughs> but, but that's the world we live in. So, you will, so sometimes we're distracted because we're answering 15, bu budget questions related to 15 as opposed to 13. So the golden rule, if you ever talk to anybody in the government and they talk about the budget, your first question ought to be, which one? <laughs> because they're all different. Okay, next slide. So these are the two points that I want to make before we go into uh, frequently asked questions. 
on the left hand side, very general statements, but I want you all to understand, if you see this happening, I hope that the context that I gave you makes you understand what we're doing and why we're slowing down expenses. So as we slow down expenses, you should expect us to begin to do th things like minimally fund future task orders and delivery orders. Having a couple of hundred artisans on a two-week task order is not how we typically do business. So especially if your task orders are omen, related task orders, the pressure that we have, we have to try to preserve every nickel and dime we have to get back to a $40 billion spend rate. So don't be surprised if that starts to happen. You should expect our folks to ask a lot of questions about non-labor in the contracts. Are we driving things that you all are having to do that's causing you to spend non-labor dollars? If we're doing that, you need to help us think about whether that's the right thing to do. So please, take a look at that and talk to the technical folks on the other side to see if there's things we can do there. Lastly, we really have to pay attention and monitor and prioritize our obligations. So in a normal case, when we obligate it, we expect it to obligate an expense over some period of time. If there's some reason why monies that we have obligated is not getting expensed, we might want to use that obligation somewhere else. And we don't want to do it in a way that it's causing chaos, but if we got money that's stuck because of whatever reason, that's precious money that we, we need to understand whether or not we should move it somewhere. So please uh, keep that in mind. On the right-hand side, if, and I'm going to say if, and I'm going to say if again, <laughs> if a government furlough of the civilian workforce happens, here's four things I want you all to think about. First, if the Navy reduces operating schedules, how does it affect on-site support? Because a lot of the folks we ask from you all from company standpoint sit in our spaces. Second, how contract oversight would be affected. In some cases, we need a government person there to monitor and approve some of the work that your folks do. If they're not there, how does that affect the authoritative approval of work? Third, options to minimize the impacts to the mission and to the people. And just because we're at PACS, one good example about mission is flight schedules for testing. That's going to be a problem. <laughs> and then on the people side, you know, this is going to be a big effect on, on the civilian workforce. It's going to be a big effect because of the salary implications, but it's going to be a big effect on the people in a general sense just from stress. And lastly, and you'll hear me say this at least three times, and I might say it five. <laughs> The government does not make furlough decisions regarding contractor employees. So we change work. We change requirements. We talk to you all via contract vehicle. You all, as industry leaders, have to deal with the people. So that gets messy when we've created these teams that are co-located, sitting together, very committed, they know each other personally, they've developed great bonds. You all and we, on our side, need to reinforce to the folks that that's how this happens. So when they're sitting in a team meeting and somebody's talking about furloughs because it's on their mind, you need to tell your folks that, you know what, we'll talk to you later from a company standpoint and you're our employee and we'll figure out what's the right thing to do. So please, that is a big deal right now. And we had a town hall yesterday with some of our business folks on the base, and I said that there three times. Because so, I'm trying to remind our folks that your team, if you're a team leader, they're not all the same when it comes to these issues. So please, if you can help clear that confusion up with your employees, that would help. We're going to do our best on the, on the government side to clear it up. Uh, next slide. 
So mission essential planning. And I, I changed the word. There's a lot of questions around travel. Uh, there was a lot of questions around different types of things related to mission essential. So what I wanted to do is just answer it in a very general sense for you to just try to help you understand how we're handling mission essential determinations. We're giving guidance out to our management levels, whether it's acquisition program managers where PEOs are telling program managers uh, the guidance that they're using. If we have competencies or commands, those commands and competencies have issued guidance. And then what we're doing is saying, take this guidance, apply it to your work, and here's the approval levels that we need to validate that you've made a good decision because we have to be so precise about our money right now, we're putting a lot more oversight on it than we normally would. And so that's what's happening. So as, as a determination on mission essential comes up through the organization, depending on where it comes up, there's guidance, thought, and, and definitions that we've given them to think through how to apply it to their situation, and then we approve it if they've got the right thought behind it. If they don't, we'll ask them to go back and think a little harder on it. So that's how requirements are being prioritized. And in a lot of cases, especially, I'm going to keep going, especially in the OMEN areas, we're asking the folks, what's the minimum level of money that you can deal with, not cause harm to the product that we need to deliver to the fleet, and not cause harm to people that support the product? And so that's a pretty consistent question that's going to happen. So we have folks who are coming up with, I'll say, standard operating procedures, right? We typically put 12 months of funding on that delivery order. That's how we've done it for the last five years. So we have to go back and say, we can't do that right now. So you can't think that you're going to fund it for 12 months for this particular task, for this particular color money, because we're trying to deal with a financial issue. So those are just examples of the conversations that we have to make sure that we're spending just the right amount of money. What appropriations are affected? All government appropriations are affected. FMS funding is not. But I'm gonna give you a very big caveat to that. We're asking our folks who support FMS to be mindful of the situation of their counterparts who are working on domestic programs and please be thoughtful in what you do and how you spend that money. The last one, what are the travel restrictions for CSS contractors? What we've done is folks have looked at their travel requirements. Somebody within the organization who's responsible for that product task function is deciding what's the minimal amount of events that they need to participate in to keep the work going, and what's the minimum amount of people they need at each event to support the mission. And then from that, there'll be names of people that are the right people to go to those events, and sometimes they're gonna be contractors from your companies, sometimes they're gonna be civilians, sometimes they're gonna be military. That's how we're going through travel priorities. So it's really driven by the folks who are responsible for the work looking really hard at what they really need to do from a travel standpoint, minimal number of people, eventually getting it down by name, and that's how we're approving things. So your folks should be getting a very clear signal from either an IPT leader or a competency manager or whoever their, their requirement determiner is on the government side on whether that's a mission critical event that they need to attend, and they're the person that's got to go. So that's how that's being handled. Next slide. Furloughs. In the event, I should have put if so I could keep saying if again. <laughs> In the event the civilian personnel furlough, does the government anticipate CSS personnel will be furloughed? If so, how will this process be implemented? How much advance notice? The government does not furlough contractor employees. I'm going to say it again. The government does not furlough contractor employees. What we'll do, if we're given notification to plan for a furlough, 
We'll probably start out with a big room and a lot of people trying to figure out how do we get an organized understanding of what we're going to try to do. And that will probably be base by base. And then out of that, we'll engage with you all on how you all can help us make sure that we got a good plan. So that's what will happen. But that will not happen until we get a formal notification of a furlough and we're told to plan. I talked about bargaining units. We have very specific rules around how much notification we need to give our civilian employees and how much notification we need to give our bargaining units. So when, when we're talking about this stuff, there's a lot of things we have to do to deal with our civilian workforce as well as with you all. So please be mindful of that. And please be mindful of the stress that it's putting on the civilians. Next bullet. <clears throat> Regardless of whether the government, civilian personnel are furloughed, do you envision reductions to spending on service contracts? If the continuing resolution holds, if there's no transfer authority, and if sequestration hits, here's what I know. We will have less money. If we have less money, we will do less work. And if we do less work, there's a pretty good chance it might affect contracts and it might affect civilian workforce. That's what I know. And until this starts to really take shape and we get very directive signals on what work specifically the Navy tells us not to do, I can't tell you where those are going to happen. And so I know that's not a, a warm feeling of, because of all the uncertainty. But that's why we wanted to spend the day talking to you all directly so that you know what do we know, what do we not know, what are the plans that we're trying to deal with, and what's some of the context around the situation. So uh, with that, next slide. I know there's probably a lot of questions you all might have. If you send an email to that email account, we'll take the question in. We might not answer the question directly. We would rather go back with theme questions and answers like we did before. The reason being, this afternoon when we talk to the 12 or 14 sites, they're going to have about 14 rooms about this size, so you can imagine the volume that we might get. And we do want to address your questions, but from our standpoint, it might be more manageable if we address them in themes. So please, don't take any responses that we give you back as not listening to you. 